Uh, so good afternoon everyone, uh, and it is uh, my pleasure to introduce the panel we've got, uh, an experienced panel and hopefully a thought-provoking panel as well. Uh, so I've already got Hamish up on stage, uh, but also ask uh, Dr Eric Crampton, who's Chief Economist at the New Zealand Initiative, uh, to join us. Uh, also Dr Greg Severinson, uh, he is the Senior Policy Researcher at EDS. And then finally, Bernard Hickey, economic and political commentator with the New Zealand Parliamentary Press Gallery. Uh, so while they come up on stage, I'll, I'll just do a little bit of scene setting. Uh, we are here to, dis uh, to discuss integrated governance, planning and questions, uh, sorry, and delivery. It is a big topic with a lot of aspects to it. Um, do encourage you to uh, send in questions via Slido and to vote on the current questions. Uh, and I'll do my best to feed those into the discussion. We are at something of a crossroads uh, with a number of systemic challenges facing us. Uh, we've got environmental degradation, unaffordability in terms of housing, significant congestion, regional decline, climate change, and rapid technological change as well. And facing these challenges, it does beg the question of whether our current systems and institutions are fit for purpose and do actually equip us to deal with these challenges ahead. Uh, so we'll go through some questions with the panel, but as we do, uh, a few questions for the audience to ponder as well. Um, are our planning governance and funding systems the cause of where we are now? If so, what's wrong with them? Uh, is it all due to the RMA? What responsibility should local government be taking? Uh, is Dave Cull right? Um, does local government have the capacity and the capability to assist? What role should central government be taking? Uh, is the UDA the answer to our prayers? Is it just about a lack of money or is it a combination of all of the above? Uh, so. We'll start, uh, we heard earlier from uh, David Hermans in relation to urban development authorities, and uh, Greg, I'll go to you first. Um, there's been a lot of criticism of planning laws, the RMA, um, particularly the last government, it seemed that that was the, the chief culprit, and what we do have now is a succession of reforms and now a bit of a Frankenstein statute. Um, does it need a complete overhaul? Well, it, uh, I think it, the UDA is one way in which we can tackle housing, but I think that the, there are also some concerns, and I think, as always, the devil will be in the detail here. So, um, touching on, on a few of those concerns, perhaps, a UDA, I think the risk is that we set its strategic objectives too narrowly. So, if we're responding to the housing crisis, we can go on there and, and use a UDA to create a whole lot of houses, and that may well solve that problem. Um, but speaking to some people in Australia, they had concerns that, I mean, a UDA can be kind of the, the equivalent of uh, an urban development equivalent of a one-night stand. It, it comes in and, and goes away again um, and leaves some legacy issues behind it. So we need to think really carefully about the balance of things that it does. Um, so are its strategic objectives just to provide housing? Um, are they about community well-being more broadly? How does that integrate into other um, aspects of development? Um, another concern is about the role of local government. Um, and so I mean, if local government agrees that a UDA is a good idea, then that's good. But the flip side of that is that it then loses control over those development outcomes as it progresses. Um, so, for example, ca could we possibly use a UDA to redesign an entire city? I mean, potentially, there's no, um, you know, the devil is in the detail there. Um, and if so, how does that relate to the idea of strategic spatial planning? Um, if a UDA can be used for greenfields developments as much as brownfields, are we going to see this kind of this pressure on relieving um, housing prices expressed through this kind of ad hoc expansion of cities without that strategic look? Um, I, dear, dear to my heart as an uh, uh, employee of EDS is uh, this idea of environmental bottom lines as well. Um, so uh, I think that at least under the previous proposal in the discussion document around UDAs, um, there was this ability to override part two of the RMA. Um, and I would just query, are 
environmental bottom lines really the things that are holding up urban development or the provision of housing is this throwing the baby out with the bathwater or kind of not even recognizing that there's a baby in there to start with or are we really talking about some different things other than environmental bottom lines so um, things that we might be more willing to trade off um, amenity concerns, densification, nimbyism, that kind of thing. They're not always the same kinds of things. Um, and lastly, I guess, uh, th this issue over legislative design. Um, we're witnessing this increasing trend to uh, create exceptions, um, alternative planning tracks, um, and kind of legislative carve-outs. Uh, is that really a good idea? Um, do we want the system to be a, a coherent whole, and is it time that we rethink the whole thing? rather than having these targeted interventions as our solutions? Uh, a number of aspects there. One of the p parts you picked up on was around the uh, tension between central government and local government and who's got responsibility. Um, Bernard, do you have a view on the role of local government? Um, is Dave Cull right that local government should have more tools in the toolbox and, and have a greater role, or is it really central government that needs to step up? It's clear there is an infrastructure funding catch-22 where uh, the growth that's coming from population is essentially controlled by migration policy if you have one, and voters at the local level don't have control of that migration policy, but they're the ones who have to pay for the infrastructure through their councils. And as Dave pointed out, as growth happens, the benefits of the growth go to the central government. Who, th who are then not responsible for a lot of the infrastructure at the local level. So you have this horrible situation where the people who should really be putting up their hand and paying for the infrastructure for the growth, in theory, people in those areas where the growth's happening, um, don't actually want the growth uh, or don't want to pay for that growth, and then the people at the central government level don't have the tools uh, to be able to spend it. Uh, or in particular, they make a choice not, for their own reasons, not to basically borrow the money and spend it on that infrastructure. So we've got this horrible catch-22 at the moment. The only way to sort of break it is to, as you say, give some more funding tools to local government. The problem is at the moment, though, uh, that the voting public appear to trust central government more than they do local government. If you look at the voting rates, the difference between local and central government, and um, the way that councils operate, uh, which appear to be um, less, I suppose you could call it um, simple or, or less um, painful than some local governments. I mean, I'm thinking from a public point of view, the difference between a cabinet process where a prime minister has a private cabinet meeting, they make a cabinet decision, they move ahead, they do something. A council where you've got public discussions, debates between councillors, no party system. And in the end, the public seem to trust local government less than they trust central government. And the problem is, of course, if you're going to give voting powers and spending powers to local government, they need to be trusted by the people. And that's one of the problems that we have at the moment. Um, I could see how you could try and get around it with um, special purpose vehicles and, and those sorts of you know, um, off-balance sheet funding issues, but again, you know, we're talking about, I saw on the slide above from David that we're not talking about an urban development authority until March 2019. Uh, the infrastructure bonds idea seems to be, you know, parked in policy land before we get any um, uh, legislation through. You know, we're talking the government itself, which really could move a lot faster simply by borrowing this money and doing the infrastructure in its own right has decided for its own reasons not to do that, at least now, they might go to an election and, and promise it. But the guts of it is, we're not looking at serious increase in infrastructure funding and the tools that we're talking about here for another two or three years. Meanwhile, we've just had five years of 2% per year population growth, half a million people basically added to our country, that's twice as fast as the population growth in Britain or America. We didn't plan for it, we haven't invested for it, and now we're not looking to actually do the infrastructure funding and spending until another two or three years. I think it's, as a property owner, I'm thrilled to bits because my house price just went up another 5,000 while I was sitting here talking. Mm. 
And that goes to Hamish's comment from his presentation earlier about the, the incentives for local government. Eric, do you have a comment on the in incentives that local government have and, and sure. how we can change that system? Yeah, so this is a, I'm with the New Zealand Initiative, we're a Wellington think tank, and this is an area that we've been looking at for at least five years now. We'd started in looking at the problem of housing affordability and quickly saw that it was all the regs that lock up land supply that are dri were driving then a start of a housing affordability crisis, and it's only gotten worse. Uh, that led us then to ask, well, why do councils set rules that just look stupid? And you then look to council's incentives and the costs and the benefits that they face, and the outcomes that we get are what we would expect given the incentive structures. And that's why you get a little bit worried about pushes to just replace the RMA or things like that where council wasn't, councils weren't forced to use fairly restrictive planning rules in the RMA. They could have set fairly liberal ones. Instead, they reinvented the Town and Country Act under in old wine and new bottles problem, right? Because the incentives hadn't changed. You rejig the RMA if you haven't fixed the incentives facing local government so that they've got better funding lines that are tied to their own performance, you're just gonna get a recreation of the current, current problems. And that's the other pro worry that I then have with the UDAs, right? It's a bit of a sledgehammer approach that comes at the end of a big crisis and it doesn't structure the incentives for councils to make better decisions for the longer term to make sure we don't get in that kind of a spot again. But it's, it's the end result of the funding tools being controlled by the central government mm -hmm. and not wanting to give any of that funding back to local government. So they'll do the infrastructure and planning from a central level because they've yep. got the central... Well, you're locked money. in this stupid part where l central government fundamentally doesn't trust local government because there's huge heterogeneity and capabilities across different local councils. And then where local councils aren't given remit to actually do anything, it's hard for them to start building that kind of trust and demonstrate that they've got the capabilities. Uh, a couple of years back, I'd had a report with Kyari Acharya where we were arguing for a more bespoke form of devolution. I'd seen a question up there about the Manchester City Accords. We were pitching a version of decentralization where local government in conversation with their communities could approach Treasury or an agency of central government saying, these are the areas where we think we can do better than central government in welfare policy or in resource management or any other area that's currently central government remit. These are the outcomes that we want you to track us on. You've got all kinds of great data now in StatsNZ's integrated data infrastructure. See if we're achieving what we said we were going to achieve. If it works and if central government gets more tax revenue as consequence of it, give local council a share of the benefits of the growth that their innovation allowed to happen. So it's not just a straight funding line to local government that isn't tied to incentives, because that can end up getting a little bit mushy, but it's keyed fundamentally to whether they're able to perform and provide better outcomes for their communities. But what if the community actually doesn't want that growth? What if they actually are quite happy with their perfect semi-rural lifestyle and don't want the extra people coming in? When you've got a local community which essentially um, doesn't want growth, they can reflect that by controlling their council and put councillors in place who say, yeah, it looks fine to have that growth, but actually all my voters, they quite like the current views and don't want to change a thing. So what, what, what we saw in America there is those communities do want growth. There's some extent, I think, I think Dallas is starting to get a bit over it now, but uh, <laughs> it's been growing so fast for a long time. But the problem we've got here is central government, it holds all the levers and its, its objectives are always political. So if it's dishing out some money to Auckland, it's got to dish out two more dollars <laughs> to everywhere else in New Zealand, because otherwise there's going to be some throwback. Now, if you had a system where local government had that funding, and local government was spending that money, and local government made the decision to tax its own citizens, and central government wasn't there to just pick up the tab, you know? Because at the moment, you just wait. You just vote for your guy or gal, and if they don't give it to you, you vote for the other one. And you just do that until you get what you want. You know you're going to get it at some stage. Now, what if central government didn't do that? What if they just, what if there was nothing? You guys get nothing. You don't want growth, that's fine. That's fine, we don't, you know, we're a free society. We should be a free society. Probably not. Surely it's okay to say, actually, you know what, we're, we're, we're happy with our society or community, we don't want growth. But you cover the costs. You cover the costs of that. You've got a train station in the middle of your place, that's fine, but your land values are going to go through the roof. But you cover the costs. You want a growth, 
you cover the costs. We started, we've started to rely on regulation to control growth rather than simply having price and the fair price. Yeah, on Bernard's point, the current system is, has huge biases against growth already in it. If in setting up a more liberal structure, there are some communities that chose against growth, you would still have a lot that like growth that would be enabled to pursue it. So just because you can't solve every single problem in the world shouldn't be stopping us from doing something that's an awful lot better. I think perhaps we, we need to be asking a, a much harder question here as well about whether we actually want growth in the long term. I mean, looking out 50 to 100 years from now, what do we want New Zealand to look like? Um, uh, there have been comments previously that we don't have a population policy. All of these things are intimately linked with migration and demographics. Um, so, I mean, do we, do we want the middle third of the North Island to end up as one enormous urban agglomeration um, in the, the Golden Triangle and beyond? Um, and I think that's a, that's a mature conversation that, as a nation, we need to have. Um, the questions at the moment seem to be much more around how we either encourage growth for economic reasons or how at least we um, you know, facilitate it or accommodate it or respond to it rather than um, thinking about what are the things we want and what are the costs of doing that in the long term. Because at the moment we're not planning that at all. We just let it happen. We might make some tweaks around the edges. The last five years there were some tweaks but they weren't responsible for you know, an extra 450,000 people coming. Some of that was natural population growth, it was mostly migration. And um, we seem to have this assumption in New Zealand that, oh, don't worry, the migration will stop and we'll get back to our normal state, which is no growth. And um, our main role in life is to not invest anything for the long term because now's the time to consume. We actually have to get away from this I think this attitude of the last 30 or 40 years, um, Hamish talked about attitude as an issue. We used to be really good yeah. at, at essentially investing for our grandkids and not consuming now. And essentially, um, in a way, taking on debt and servicing that debt. If I went out there now as the mayor of Auckland and said, I've decided to um, invest in the future of this city for generations uh, two or three down the track, and I want you to service the debt for it, I'd be voted out in a second. And to be honest, th this is a, in a way a cultural discussion about how long term we plan, uh, whether we think it's our role to fund for future generations. And at the moment, we're sort of kidding ourselves that uh, we can get by as it is. Our population grew 2% last year, and if you look at the amount of infrastructure spend per head of population growth, it has halved in the last three or four years. We got the population growth, we didn't plan for it, we're still not investing in it, and actually there's nothing that I've seen in this discussion it, to say it's going to change any time soon. Well, if you start fixing council's incentives, you start re-enabling trust in local government, a lot of what you're pointing to, I agree with a lot, uh, a lot of the symptoms, I think the diagnosis though is that Voters, a lot of them just don't trust local councils because in prior eras, if they've authorized more spending or more debt, it's been spent on lollipops and things that they didn't want. So the only way that they've had to constrain councils against doing dumb things is to keep a really big throttle on, er, on the amount of tax that they can raise. But that's led us to this stupid outcome where we can't invest in the infrastructure that we need. So then we start thinking again about proper incentives for councils so that they're doing the things that need to get done, special purpose vehicles for funding the infrastructure so that you've got that trust already embedded in because if the project doesn't pass any reasonable cost benefit assessment, nobody's gonna finance it and the beneficiaries of it are the ones who are paying for it rather than the broader tax base. All of those things start fixing the incentives. I agree. But if I went to the cabinet right now and the last government's cabinet and said, right, you've just got this um, uh, productivity commission report saying this is what you should do, and look at the Shand report from 10 years ago, <laughs> what, what, copy and paste, and they, they look at that and go, ah, nah. And so what do we end up with? We're going to end up with a productivity commission report at the end of next year which says, uh, we had a look at Shand, it looks pretty good, copy, paste, bang, and the government says, Actually, no, I don't want to give up my funding control. Sorry. Yeah, think about the coalition dynamics too, though. You've got uh, Ron Markin there, for, former mayor. New Zealand First has a reasonable commitment towards localist solutions. And a government in Twyford that has seen the manifest failures that have come from having the incentives all broken. Um, 
I think that there's a reasonable opportunity for pushing more localist solutions and getting the incentives right. But do, does that require tinkering around the edges, or is it a fundamental reform of local government legislation, though? We need a fundamental restructuring of the relationship between local and central government and a re-enabling of local governments so that they can take on more authorities where they've demonstrated a capability of doing it. Can, can I um, make the case for um, going back to the future here, which is we have a government with a balance sheet that has 20% net debt. If I was a young family going to a banker right now, any bankers in the room, and I said to you, I've got net debt of 20%, I'm a young family, both of us work, we've got two young kids, and we want to borrow four times our income to build this fantastic house that's going to underwrite this family's growth and uh, a healthy future for our kids. And the banker would go, yeah, where do I sign? Actually, would you like six times income? Thank you very much. And here's a free flat screen TV. Yet our government is refusing to go out into the market to borrow the 10, 20 billion that we need to actually get these infrastructure projects going. At 2.7%, it costs the government right now 2.7% to borrow that. It's actually cheaper than the American government. And to unleash a lot of infrastructure spending, yes, it would be a sort of a reinvention of the Ministry of Works, or it would be, I mean, maybe you just get a whole bunch of people to do this and you plan it and you give a lot of certainty to people, because at the moment, we're mucking around, inventing infrastructure bonds and urban development authorities, and yes, you'd probably need to do that, but we're gonna be talking another two to three years before we even start on the process. By then, the central banks might have actually stopped printing money, and interest rates might be four or five percent. Well, there are I versions of that that can work really well. Um, I, I know last night, John Key making a bit of the case for that here, which is a bit of a surprise, but that is good. Um, where the money is used for designating infrastructure corridors for future, for example, and buying the rights of way, I can see a really good case for that, making sure that we've got things set so there's a corridor so we can start having some of the satellite cities come up. That's great. But can you imagine a big infrastructure bond push now to solve Auckland's problem for it? What kind of incentives does that set for any other council to behave reasonably? Where if you, if you know that if you stuff things up for long enough, the guy with the big checkbook is going to come in and fix the problem for you, that's, that creates terrible incentives. And at the same time, we've, hit, we've known big problems in construction capabilities. We don't have enough uh, bodies on the ground to be able to get a lot of these jobs done. What happens if that infrastructure spend up is on getting people in the shovels, but we don't have that many with the shovels right now? The price of construction just goes through the roof, right? If you've not, like everything that uh, Minister Twyford and Mr. Robertson were talking about earlier about expanding capabilities, that's a slow fuse burn, right? You start training people up now, get them into the apprentice in apprenticeships, what have you got, three, five years before you've got some people that start knowing what they're doing? But what we're doing at the moment is we're going to wait for another three years before we even start that. Spend now on the infrastructure corridors where you actually don't really... Th the money is cheap now. You put the money into those projects now where you're not going to just be inflating construction costs and not competing for the very scarce resources and enabling the project-based financing that will let c cities grow for the longer term and get their s incentive set. But you're right, we're not going to do much for the next two or three years because it's taken us two or three years to get to this point and then we're going to have another election in a little bit. Well, actually, we're going to have a local government election next year, a place like Auckland, who knows? Then you get a central government election the year after that, so we're on an 18-month so growth what cycle. So what I don't get is I'm in front of a room full of people who it's in their interests for the government to solve this problem, both central and local government. Why aren't they screaming at central and local government to provide the infrastructure so that they can unleash the productivity growth in their businesses and make sure that the people who they want for their jobs can actually live close to their jobs in affordable housing. I'm just not hearing that at all. Well, remember, these, these incentives are pretty perverse. They've mixed up the system, you know? It's like a lot of business folk here are crying out and they're, they're losing, starting to lose people to Australia. Australia have seen that they got a problem and just responded full throttle. They're crazy. I don't know how they do it, but they do it. But what we're going to see here is, is this continued cycle of, of delay and deference yeah. and whatnot until, we, until people see that if they don't do something, they carry the cost. You know? And at the moment, those costs aren't shared. And so a lot of people here are not business owners or whatever, and their house price is quite high. They think Fantastic. they've done quite well. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, that cost has been shifted onto a part of society. We've got a bifurcated Auckland of 50% of 
who own property and are doing a little dance, and 50% and who have seen their rent exceed their incomes for a long time and they're hurting. They're not empowered, they're not in the room, by and large, um, and then probably not being reflected in the media. Uh, they're being sometimes reflected in the, in the words the politicians say, but the politicians are also going to balance the bigger picture. We, we, we've fundamentally have to change the whole structure of decision making. Yeah. And it's UDAs aren't doing that either. That it feels like a rehash of the yep. mess that we had in Christchurch after the earthquakes, right? So you had central local government partnerships. I know there was some discussion earlier about, well, this time we're just going to consult more with local government. They consulted lots with local government last time. They just stuffed the whole thing up. And it took so long for them to get anything moving that you had construction workers who had come for the rebuild that were fleeing because nobody could make a decision about letting anything happen, right? <laughs> and and then when we had the opportunity to keep all of those Christchurch construction visa people here and turn it into like an Auckland visa so they can go and fix Auckland, no, no, send them all away because we don't like immigrants anymore or something. Uh, Look, that's what, that's what the satellite city was about. Yeah. It was fundamentally about taking a shorter term decision. Brownfields is so damn hard. I mean, people are just not getting this. It is so hard. You, just from everything, just getting trucks down streets and the constraints on it, just getting the consents. It's so hard. We've got greenfield land with rail lines running through the bloody thing, for goodness sakes. There's a rail line right there. <laughs> you can actually go in there, get the land, and build quick, build fast, build at scale, build homes on rapid yeah. transit. It's, it's, it's right there. It's so simple. You're not talking about gross urban sprawl. You're talking about targeted development along rapid transit, which is what everybody wants, and providing jobs. So what it, stopped it? What, why didn't it happen? Uh, I think there's, there's been, I think the Auckland Council has got a plan, and it's, it's worked pretty hard to get a plan across, and it's trying to implement the plan, and we saw the chief economist here uh, yesterday talk about trying to implement the plan. What, of course, he didn't talk about was the cost of those houses, and we can't afford those houses. The $650,000 houses are unaffordable, for 60% of Aucklanders. So yes. what we need actually is someone to say, let's actually do things, make yep. some policy changes, change the funding tools to actually drive down land prices. And one of those fundamentals seems to be around whether it's urban sprawl is allowed to continue or whether there is containment. And EDS, as far as its suggestions on RMA reform is put forward, uh, separate urban and rural legislation as a possibility. Um, whereas, Hamish, you'd suggested earlier that urban limits need to sort of be done away with. How, how can we reconcile those? Greg? Um, well, I think we need to ask ourselves what really makes urban areas different from other areas. Um, and that, there might be three aspects to that. The, the first is, are environmental bottom lines really different in urban areas? And the UDA um, proposal is an example of that. We're doing away with part two, which is where we enshrine these things that are just that are intergenerational and hugely you know, existential. Um, so I don't think that's what really makes urban areas different. So let's target the actual problem. Is it a question of above bottom lines, are we willing to trade off some environmental well-being for social and economic well-being? Well, I think that might be the case. You know, I don't think we expect an urban waterway to ever be as pristine as one that flows through a national park, for example. Um, but I think the key problem is, is differentiating between some of the stuff that's in the RMA in part two um, about environmental things um, and, and the stuff that really is an issue in urban areas, and that's, that's about communities making trade-offs. And whether that community is a national community of interest or a local one, I think that has to happen on a case-by-case -case basis. But to me, the important thing is to to target the actual issue, which you know, it seems to be around things like nimbyism, things like amenity, landscape, um, density, those kinds of things, rather than second-guessing our long-term bottom lines that we're not willing to trade off, um, whether you're urban or not. Um, so uh, implementing separate urban-focused legislation from natural environment legislation, I think, is a bit of a red herring. I'll just, um, I'll just add, because there was a question there too about, about Houston and the sprawl. There's no question those cities are massive, sprawling cities. There's no question in my mind, I, I don't know anybody who would rather live in Houston than Auckland. But the critical point here is about, it's really about who carries those costs. Actually, in, in, in Texas, actually, they subsidise transport. That's why they sprawl. Well, one of the key reasons they sprawl is they subsidise. They pay 38 US cents a gallon for transport tax. That's way less than we pay a litre. 
and, and there's 3.8 litres to a gallon. So, so they, they're actually subsidising housing through their transport. Um, so what, but what you really want to do is you just want people to cover the cost of their decisions. Other thing in Texas is the government doesn't come in and do UDAs. I mean, that's about as anti-Texas as taking away gun licences, for goodness sakes. <laughs> what we have here, we don't have that model. Well, come in, but let's investment lead, not regulation lead. You come in, you spend. We want to achieve this objective. We're going to build light rail, and we want to achieve that objective. That's fine. Go hard. Go now. Make a decision on it. But don't just regulate and say, well, you can't grow out here. You can't, no. There's a real problem we've got. We say we want a collective decision, but often that collective decision is just, we're getting together to agree that we don't want that. And we can't allow that to be the case. We've got to be investment-led. We can't be regulation-led. So what's stopping that from happening now? What's, what's say, you know, like at Drury or wherever, saying, this is our land, we want to build a city on it, let's go for it? Council incentives. Councils don't have the money. They don't, they, they've got no other tools. They've just got to regulate to their affordability threshold. So they see that there's an opportunity, but they ain't got money, so they regulate it out. Well, that ain't got money thing is a choice. It's a political choice by ratepayers. Yep. But it's who, who through the incentives, though, that are in, embedded in the system, effectively, though. Well, those ratepayers could choose to have a lower credit rating and pay more for their interest by taking on the debt to fund that growth. Yep. Yeah, but the benefits of that go to new people, not themselves. Yep. And again, it. you need the special purpose vehicles that, so that the costs are loaded on the people who benefit from it. So people yep. are voting. They vote for, when you vote for livability, you essentially low vote. I mean, people don't think about livability versus affordability. When you vote for livability, you're saying, I want to consume. I want nicer stuff for me. When you're voting for affordability, you're actually saying, I want, I, want nice, I want some opportunity for the next generation. We're not very upfront about that conversation. Mm. Yeah, and so I think we are out of time, but um, thank you very much to the panel. It does seem that uh, there is a pretty significant challenge we all face, and uh, there is some significant reform required, and above and beyond that, it is a case of urgency, and there's a real call to action uh, I've heard from the panel. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.